everybody and welcome to the show. We've got a great one for you today with lots of nonsense and hijinks and Alex Sulkin from Family Guy who is going to regale us with the stories that make the Nightfly the most popular podcast for about three people. I'm joking, of course, or am I? So stay tuned because it all starts right now. everybody and welcome to another episode the audio of audio portion uh episode of the night fly coming out on june 8th i believe 2021 tuesday uh tonight i don't mind telling you at the comedy seller nightly show we have the amazing beth stelling and lil lenny marcus will be joining us uh this evening last week we had jackie tone and a very drunk Colin Smith, which was a, a little uh, annoying, but uh, you know, he's Irish. What are you going to do? You know, you got to let that go. You got to let it go. And uh, Brian Scott McFadden. But anyway, yeah, this tonight, Beth Stelling, Lenny Marcus, next week, Bonnie McFarlane and Rich Voss. I mean, they are a married couple and hate each other. And that should be high hilarious. Uh, also, uh, the coming up of the Billy Joel podcast this week, I believe, is the bees wrap up everybody's favorite. <laughs> what do you want me to tell you? And then we start with the C's with, I believe, C'était Toi. C'était Toi, which, uh, you know, is a, a great song, which I love, which I'm learning to play on the piano. But it's ruined when he speaks French. And he speaks French way too long, and he doesn't speak it very good. All to come, we'll tell you more about that on the Billy Joel podcast. The companion piece, as it may be, on the Nightfly, on Dave Juskow's Nightfly podcast. Anyway, I hope everybody's having a great week. As you know, I am recording this before I go to Boston. This week this will come out after I've already been there. So next week's podcast, we will, I will regale you with stories about uh, doing 30 minutes in front of a festive crowd, wanting to do a, a free fall, a free floating jazz odyssey in front of a festive crowd. But unfortunately, I'm trying to do Spinal Tap, but I'm not getting the voice and the accent right. But uh, yes, I will tell you how things went in Boston next week. That ought to be entertaining because really, no matter what happens, uh, comedy ensues. It's a fact. So uh, I'll tell you what I'm going to do is I think we'll go right into our interview with Alex Hogan. And on the backside, I'll show you uh, some, some pictures that I wanted to show you about stuff. And uh, then we'll call it a day. But I got to say, I did uh, pre-record the Alex Hogan interview, and it's great. I think it was one of the best times I ever had having an interview. We just had so much in common. Again, for this podcast, this guy is our our king. He is fantastic, likes all the same stuff we like. And I think it's a very, I just think it's a great interview and it's lots of fun. So I'll see you on the flip side of that, on the back side, and then we'll show some pictures and then we'll call it a day and then we'll all go home. It'll be like, a, be like the whole thing never happened. Uh, well, we don't want it to be like that, but I think you'll have a good time. So anyway, enjoy the Nightfly and Alex Hulkin coming up right now. Back off, man. I'm a scientist. The Night Fly with Dave Juskow. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the program. Uh, joining me today, I do the uh, radio voice whenever. I can't even help myself. It's like a problem. I, <laughs> joining me today is the executive producer of Family Guy and much, much more. Uh, <laughs> there was... It's Alex Hulkin, everybody. Thank you so much for coming today. It's just, Thanks do you, for having me. Thanks I don't that. think you remember. You're from Boston, right? I did remember that, yes. You... You remember the little yellow balloon from Young People's Day Camps? That's the voice I was doing. <laughs> no, no. I thought you were. You said you don't remember that you're from Boston, right? No, I, I knew you knew you were from Boston. No, okay. I. it's this voice. I did. There was a voice back. I guess it was in New York, and there was this place called Young People's Day Camps, and they had a little yellow balloon. 
that would go around an animated yellow balloon that would go around and talk about this camp. I guess it was for poor kids or something. I don't know. And he had this low wonderful speaking voice <laughs> and he goes, here at young people's day camps your kids will enjoy a summer full of fun and long swims in the pool and much much more you and always remember that stuff always you always that stuff sticks with you your whole life in right fact, you know well like, interesting voices when you're like six are, are just always in there well you guys know that better than anybody at family guy you bring back the most obscure things that clearly you and Seth remember from the same way I do. You know, I mean, nobody's going to, you know, I, I can see if I was working on that show, I would do like, Hey, let's do a little yellow balloon with the the good speaking voice. You know, I know. I think we did. Uh, I'm not sure if it ever made it to air, but we definitely for a while had this bit in where Peter is, do you remember the fig Newton commercial with big fig? Absolutely, and yeah. it was definitely in there. No, no, no. Actually, that was a Simpsons one, if I remember right, because that—that's how his mother used to put him to sleep. He used to sing the Fig Newton song. Really? Yeah, I just thought about that. Yeah. Okay. Well, we we had a different thing. Uh, clearly, ripping off the Simpsons again. Well, we uh, had a different thing with Big Fig. You know, hey, gag, Big Fig here. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, that's why. Right. The sad thing is now, like. Whereas when I first started working there, the stuff that I remembered from my youth was still like kind of acceptable to, to, it was still didn't seem like way too old. Now, when I reach back to do something, I'm like, oh, do you remember uh, the Barba Papas or, you know, the Herculoids or something? And people are like, oh my, frick, we can't talk about that anymore. And it's a great question because I guess, I assume you and Seth are about the same age or is he older? Yeah, he's, he's like, I think he's like a year younger than I am. And uh, are you even 50? You're in your 40s, right? I'm 48. I'm getting there. So, yeah, I'm about 10 years older than you. And, you know, when you make these references that I obviously know, especially any kind of Happy Days reference or anything, I'm like, how are they getting away with this? My nephew's watching. He's 19. He's a huge, huge fan. But they seem to don't care. And that is the beauty of the way we grew up, where you're watching The Odd Couple and it's two older men. And we're laughing hysterically because, yes. you know, who gives a shit? Funny yeah. is funny. No, I know. I remember distinctly watching, uh, you know, Monty Python when I was growing up. They'd show it once a week on PBS. And I used to watch it. Sunday nights. Sunday nights. And they would always, you know, and their, their sketches are obviously hilarious. But they're peppered in so many, like, pop culture and political British names and references that obviously as like a 10 year old and outside Boston, I had no idea what they were talking about, but you start to fill in the gaps. Like, and it, it got to the point where I knew the name of like different British political people just from <laughs> Monty Python, never having experienced them. Um, and I think today, hopefully if we make an old reference, if people are that interested, if they're that like big of a comedy nerd, they can go on YouTube and say like, what were they talking about? Like I, I did that with, uh, did you ever, I'm sure you've seen The Trip with Steve Coogan. Oh my and, God. Uh, we yeah. play it on the podcast all the time. It's so, obviously, it speaks for itself. It's hilarious. But they, in that, uh, in that those movies, they make a lot of reference references to things that I didn't know about. And I went through YouTube and was like looking them all up. Like, what are you, what are they talking about? And then once you find out what they are talking about, it makes their bits even funnier. I agree 100%. I was hoping you were going to say that because you're absolutely right. If we if we had the technology we have now, we would be looking up those references. There's probably oh, 100 SCTV episodes I saw where I didn't understand or I didn't know who Mel Torme was. Right. I would have looked it up. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, I didn't know as a 14, 15 year old boy. Right. Uh, and, and, and that's the beauty is if you are a comedy nerd like we are. Yeah, you have this wonderful opportunity to look stuff right. up. I was pitching a show to Comedy Central years ago about the forefathers. Uh, you know, it was a show about John Adams trying to start the country with Franklin and Franklin and Jefferson always trying to get laid, and it drives Adams crazy because he's not a multitasker and live action or animated. Live action. Okay, I love it even more. It was called uh, "Surrounded by Morons." And it's all about Adams just trying to get the country started, like this monumental task. And Franklin and Jefferson always trying to get laid and only talk about girls. And yet they're still able to do exactly what Adams could do. But Adams is straightforward focus. Yes. He does yeah. not the other yeah, thing. Like and uh, Homer's co-worker who was like by the book. Uh, Gil? No, no, no. I know exactly. Uh, Grimey. Frank Grimes. Frank Grimes. Right. <laughs> he was going to kill me if I couldn't remember. Yeah. Um, exactly. So yeah. when they were like, well, 
you know, who's going to get this? And I'm like, well, that's the beauty. If they're into it, they'll look it up. Yeah. Because the references were all based on the book, John Adams by David McCullough. Like the whole yeah. book was based on that because when I read that book, it spoke to me as a, as a comic, a comedy. Right. You know, where yeah. Adams is just this is hilarious. There's the, the pilot has them sitting there at the first continental. It's like a, we made it a meet and greet for the new delegates. They're all just getting to town <laughs> and they're all just drinking and toasting, doing all these toasts. It's in the book. Right. And Adams just wants to get down to business. And You're everybody right. just wants to party. They end up going to, uh, it's a meet and greet, but it turns into a raging kegger from Animal House, you know, like right. <laughs> delegates come in and they're like, do you think they'll take us in? And the keg comes out the window and, you know, like, I, I know you were, you guys playing cards? <laughs> that scene is in and stuff. That's hilarious. But yeah, he, and he just goes crazy. And again, you'd look it up and see that it was true. And that was the, the point. And it is kind of a great thing. But yeah. with you guys recently, I would say I, last year, you made the reference to you guys being old and making these old references that yeah, people what, might not get what did we say i forget i i don't know. i don't remember but it was yeah. you brought light to yeah. you know making these flying nun references or something that right. you know right. only right. you mean you know a couple a handful of people are gonna get but right yeah. it's the world to me <laughs> well, thank you right. thank you for your service <laughs> oh, thank you. you're welcome well it does so so today and we'll talk about a bunch of stuff and again thank you so much for coming on because um it really having... means a lot to me and you're oh. such a nice guy oh please ditto back at you well i was thinking uh i was thinking how happy i was that we remained friends and became friends and yes i guess i, guess I can say how we became friends you don't of care. course of course right? you were dating my best friend in Sarah Silverman. Yes. And uh, what a lucky break that is for me. You know, <laughs> that she meets you. And, you know, already I know you write for Family Guy. And I'm like, well, he can't suck. You know, <laughs> right. It would be impossible, right? <laughs> well, she, she might argue with that, but yes. Yeah, she might, but I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, then we met. And I don't remember the timeline, whether it's the second time, the third time, whatever it is. But there were three instances where I'm like, Geez, I, I hope if it doesn't end well, I hope we can be friends forever. Yes. I totally gets it. And yeah. you even said once, and it, this is how much it meant to me. You're like, you know, I think we're going to become fast friends. Yes. And uh, I was like, see, I was feeling the same thing, but I didn't want to say it. Well, no, you're like, I mean, in, in the realm of like your girlfriend saying, oh, I have this friend you have to meet. Like you couldn't have been a better result. Oh, that, thank you. <laughs> you know, like of, of that uh, initial sort of statement. That actually happens a lot. It's one of those things like, I don't know if I like you hanging out with this guy. And then they meet me. They're like, oh, you can even sleep in the same hotel room. It's fine with me. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, oh, Dave? Dave's the best. Yeah, yeah. right. Don't worry about this guy. Nobody's <laughs> ever in uh, yeah. fear tell, of me. Except. Tell Dave he's the son of a bitch from me. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but there were two things you did in specific. You pulled out the Christopher Reeve picture out of your wallet from I mean Clark Kent. Yes. And I'm like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I love this guy. I yeah. mean, I those, have those I had one in my wallet, wallet too. <laughs> right, of course. As one does. Well, Alec, his performance as Clark Kent is one of the premier comic performances of our time that people don't even get, which might be where our comedy is based on. It's but it's it's and it's right there on the par and online with Tootsie. And it's the same kind of thing. He's he's yeah. doing two two distinct characters and he's nailing both of them nailing them right and that's honestly that's of course and gene hackman th those are the two secrets of of the first and let's not forget john williams but uh the composer yeah oh yeah yeah right yeah you, you don't want to forget him um but just christopher reeve obviously he he gave a humanity to superman that hasn't existed nope. in my opinion before or since Yep, nobody's been able to come up with the perfect blend. He's not even, you know, I'm sure you were like, I was like, I'll see anything he's in because to me, he will be my hero. Yeah. But I've always, I've talked about this on this podcast multiple times because I like talking about acting and actors. Sure. And he's an awful actor. I don't know if you've seen him in other things, like I Somewhere think, in Time. You know, though I have saw him in the one thing that was actually decent, which was uh, uh, Mouse Trap or Death Trap. A Death Trap with death Michael Caine. Yeah. yeah, that was terrific. I saw that multiple times. Yeah, and but it's funny because in some ways it seems like he in like in Superman, he's a fantastic actor. So it's hard for me because 
I, I really haven't seen him in that much else. So I'm inclined to give him like the benefit of the doubt. And he was a very funny uh, as a host on SNL. SNL. For her. One of the best episodes of all time. So That's funny. One, uh, because that was the season with Martin Short and Billy Crystal. It would have been hard to fuck that up. Dream team. Dream right. team. That's the one with the wheel where Sammy Davis is trying to explain to Christopher Guest uh, the yeah. chocolate babies. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm going to come at you in a different direction, man. Right. Yeah. That's one of my favorite scenes of all time. I mean, that's a classic scene. And and that one with Christopher Reeve, I believe they had the Superman auditions. Oh, right. <laughs> of course. Yes. Uh, yeah. Right. Was that with Victoria yeah. Jackson? Uh, maybe no, pre-Victoria Jackson. I think it was... Uh, Julia Louis Dreyfus. Right. Yes, it was Julia yeah. Louis Dreyfus. Yes, and in that apartment, she might have been scurrying around behind you. <laughs> but, uh, and Gary Kroger was the uh, the right. one who was sort of like in the lead to get it. Right. Yeah, yeah I totally remember that. But the, so Christopher Reed, the thing is, like I've seen all his other work, you know, because I can't get enough of it. Even the Rear Window when he was in the wheelchair. Which, oh, that's but, tough. But I worshipped him so much. I just wanted to support him. I just wanted to support him. You know, he meant right. so much to me and you, obviously, as a kid. Yeah. And, and so like in somewhere in time and these other things, you can see him acting, you know, you can see him acting, but it still doesn't even bother me because he's just such a likable person. Clearly from everything I've heard about him. Oh, I know. Was this kind of joyous person to be around. Totally. So, so tragic, but I know. but yeah, so it, it, so it didn't matter to me. <laughs> like you, you can see him acting, you can see him trying yeah. in other things well, and that- I didn't care. I right. was all no. in. He already gave us such a huge gift. So, And you're so right about Gene Hackman, too. He was so funny. We already knew he was good, but, I mean, his lines that I mean, I still, like, um, think about uh, uh, what what's the one I always do all the time? Like, I never thought it would go the distance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And from two. <laughs> from two, yes. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was much funnier in two. Right. But he was, he was like, the whole, first of all, the, the evil plot in one is great. It's it might be the best evil plot of of any supervillain in like Batman, Superman, like it the, the plot to send the California coastline into the ocean, but buy up quietly all the acreage that's gonna be the new coastline. That's a great plot. It's a great plot. It's what Disney was doing if he was evil. Right. You know, in Florida when nobody knew what was going on. So yep. it made a lot of sense to me too. And then you could have Otisburg. Otisburg. <laughs> Otisburg. Otis. It's just a tiny place. It's a little, 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 little pity place. Little place. But yeah, his Christopher Reeves' performance in Superman was how I started in comedy. It was the first imitation I ever did. Um, you know, just uh, Lois, what are you doing? You know, like, <laughs> yeah, knocking yeah. on the door quietly in the women's room and stuff. Uh, Lois, uh, putting up the glasses yep. on your face uh, and the bridge of your nose. So great. He was so good. So it. You know, you know, when he, when you showed me that you had that, because it obviously meant a lot to you, too. And then nice. the second thing was, we were in a uh, a restaurant in L.A. eating outside. I don't know if you remember this. And I, I assume Sarah was with us, but I just remember you and me there in my head. <laughs> Tunnel vision. <laughs> and somebody had a, a Lamborghini or a DeLorean, whatever it was, yeah. where the car door opens the way it does in Back to the Future. The goal wing. Right. And you, is that what it's called? Uh, yes. And you start going dun, 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 <laughs> which was the proper response <laughs> and i'm like i love that he gets it sarah's like what are you guys talking about i'm like shut uh. up you stupid girl <laughs> <laughs> she's smarter than both of us put together i right? know but um well, that's the yeah, yeah. That. <laughs> yeah. that's the subtext yes um but yes to, i mean don't, i just recently watched that again and actually i i love back to the future so much that uh, I'm sure you've probably done this, but on YouTube, you can watch reaction videos. Oh, no, I haven't seen that. Like for kids watching it the first time? Yeah. <gasps> no, I haven't seen that. You can that. watch like all these different people. And Back to the Future is a very popular one to do. So there are like a hundred different ones of like kind of young people like, okay, Back to the Future and like watching it. And they're like, you know, reacting to the opening shot of the dog food turning over. And, you know, you can just tell that it's they've never seen it. Wow. And by the time they get to the end, they are so fired up. It's so great. That's so cool. It's such a confirmation of like the way we feel about that. How old is your daughter? She is five. So what is your timeline to show her 
Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back, well, and and watch these kind of things well, like that. Star Wars has already kind of like been trickled out in little parts, and and she's sort of at the age where she gets she really loves Star Wars toys. She's very excited by the concept of Star Wars and the actual watching of Star Wars. She can't quite make it very far. So like right. we'll watch and then, you know, Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru show up and she's like checked out, you know? That's when I check out usually too. I know. I'm I know. such an oh. asshole. I told yeah. you just to forget it. What a dick. <laughs> yeah, he's such a dick. Uh, you know, if he wasn't a dick, he'd still be alive. Charred, charred <laughs> city. <laughs> Who likes their ribs? Well done. <laughs> <laughs> well, it actually uh, brings up another point. As long as we're here, you on Twitter, many t you you have a great Twitter account. Oh, thank you. Uh, you know things like uh, Trump is grabbing the Constitution by the pussy, uh, yeah. stuff like that, which is all good. Yeah. But like you also that. do uh, the good stuff, which is you always have. What are your top five things? Which of course I love. Yeah. And one of them was one of the top five movie shots in history. Yes. And your listing was, I have it here. Okay, uh, good. Sharif comes out of desert, Lawrence of Arabia. Yes. Oh, D-Train pulls up to Yankee Stadium. Of course, you forgot to put in Manhattan, in which Manhattan. you got roasted on that uh, line, but in the movie Manhattan, yes. Yes, right. Uh, De Niro on the rooftops, Godfather 2. Indy puts on the hat in Sunset and Raiders. Hands down, I'm with you on that. And the club entrance in Goodfellas. Yes. I'm completely in on those two, but when we were talking about the Star Wars, I was thinking, how? Well, listen, the beauty the about the shot, list, the opening shot of Star Wars, right? Well, no, I was saying the one where he goes back and sees the charred remains. That's oh. that's a legendary shot taken from the Searchers. The uh, was that John Huston, yeah. I think. Yeah. Uh, so that shot I like a lot too. But yeah. that's the beauty about lists is totally. that they are arguable. Yes. And sometimes well, it's fun to put a, a clunker in there. So just to see people, you know, get upset. You know, about I mean, that kind of you stuff. didn't like the, the uh, I mean, I'm sure you like it, but, but the Manhattan shot wouldn't be in your top five. It would not. Okay. You yeah. know, I have a problem. I mean, for me, the Manhattan shot is where I live. I live on the block where they, over the Queensboro Bridge. Right. That's the ultimate shot, you know, so uh, it's the movie poster. So right. I would have chosen that one. Mm -hmm. uh, and I hate the Yankees, so I think that's an issue too. I, You know, I hate the Yankees as well. I grew up in Boston. But it's it's like um, so it was obviously the, the combination of, of Rhapsody and Blue with sure. – No, I understand. I understand. So that, that's what I responded to in that. And, and, and in the Lawrence of Arabia thing is like that when I first saw that, I was just blown away. So I had to put that in. I – would also, uh, so I saw one of the people were writing, like, how can you not talk about the beach football scene in Point Break, asshole? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I love when people are like, yeah. what's the matter with you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the shirtless saxophone player in Lost Boys. Yeah, right. I saw that too. What the fuck is the matter with people? But one, uh, one, one I, I did think is, which is, I would put in the list is the crop dusting scene from North by Northwest, which of course is amazing. You know, my friend Lawrence had that picture in his wallet. Oh, really? Harry Grant running from the crop duster. It's so yeah. funny. I have, a, I have a weird connection to that, too, because my maternal grandfather, uh, rest in peace, Poppy, um, his actual name was George Kaplan, which is the oh, name that... Mr. Kaplan. Car yeah, Cary Grant is mistaken for, which sort of sets the whole plot in, in motion. And, and right. my grandfather tells a story that doesn't have a satisfying ending. There, where he was in a movie the or a theater in New York in the 60s and he happened to be one row in front of Cary Grant and he proudly showed him his driver's license and said here I'm George Kaplan <laughs> <laughs> George Mr. Kaplan yes they provide you with such good ones oh you have a you have sort of a James Mason vibe too. yeah I think I can do it wait um these things are best taken care of at heights well above water oh that's so good Leonard? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Leonard. he is, I mean, he's, I feel like he started the British villainry, the Alan Rickman's, uh, you know, all that yes. stuff. He, he, was had, he had a perfect, perfect voice for that. Um, I, a classy villain. Uh, did you, I, I'm sure you have, and you're probably one of the few people on earth who has. Did you ever see a movie called The Last of Sheila? No. Okay. Well, this, 
it was a it was one of those like almost like an Agatha Christie style murder mystery movie from the early 70s and it has it stars Dick Benjamin <laughs> uh, D D Diane Cannon Raquel Welch wow James Mason Ian McShane and there's like one other big star I'm forgetting oh uh, James Coburn Oh. And it's set on a yacht in the south of France where this James Coburn has assembled everybody for a birthday party. And of course, somebody ends up dead. And it's a great, great mystery. But I remember my mom, for whatever reason, taped that on Betamax off of, you know, some some movie channel. So for some reason, I've seen that movie like 30 times. Uh, but James Mason is peak, peak James Mason in that. His voice is, you know, trying I mean, to once figure it out. Once I saw, is it, was it Absence of Malice? Where's the one that the, the Paul Newman is uh, the lawyer? The verdict. Verdict, right. Yeah. And I used to just do that imitation all the time. Like, well, of course, the kind of law you'd like to practice takes money and time. And uh, <laughs> I, I just get, oh, his, my favorite thing of James Mason, and I know you might be the only person that knows, is in the Shining documentary. I didn't, he's in it? Yeah. He, he, so, they have that half hour one where they only made it to look she make Shelly Duvall look ridiculous. Oh. Um, did you you've seen it? I've seen parts of it and I've seen many people shitting on Shelly Duvall and and sort of claiming that Kubrick terrorized her the whole That's what the entire his daughter made the documentary so it's only made to make her look stupid. I think I've seen that but I don't remember James Mason. Yeah, so he comes in at one point as Jack Nicholson's guest. Right. And she's like doing the testimonial like they would nowadays, you know, to the camera. Like, you know, I don't understand. James Mason comes here and he doesn't introduce Jack Nicholson, doesn't introduce him to me. He just goes over to Jack Nicholson. And, you know, I'm here, too. And he's just like, my dear, I'd like to meet Jack Nicholson. And uh, <laughs> that's my favorite part of the movie. <laughs> and, of course, Shelley Duvall's upset, but it's they clearly just edited it to make her look just stupid. I felt bad for her, actually. It, the uh, James where... Mason, it would have been so great to have James Mason as like a, an older relative in your family. Like if you got to sit around like a Thanksgiving table with him, that would probably be the best. The first Thanksgiving was the finest of all because at that time we didn't know where it was going to lead. <laughs> yeah, That's I a mean, great Mason. He, oh, he was, I mean. Now can, can you go Mason to Mason with Jackie? Yes, actually, I can. Because, you know what? Tonight, I'm actually working with Sheba Mason, the daughter of Jackie Mason, tonight at her club. I do that for her all the time. She's like, oh. <laughs> and show me Marsha Mason. <laughs> Damn it, I was doing Richard. Oh, no, I, just no. got there. I don't like the panties drawing on the rod. <laughs> I almost got there. Right movie. Uh, oh, by the way, you're a, you like Broadway stuff, right? Yes. I right. mean, some. Some very much and some not so much. On Gilbert Godfrey's podcast, they had Marsha Mason on, and she said uh, she was the one that came up with the idea to make Cassie get in the chorus. The original thing was that she wasn't going to make it. Really? And she said she, you know, Michael Bennett asked her opinion because she was with Neil Simon. And he wanted him to come. What do you think? What do you think of the show? She goes, we, what are you guys, crazy? She's got to make it. We want a happy ending, jerk off. <laughs> so uh yeah that so was, it was originally like a dark 70s ending dark 70s ending right like you guys do on family guy with the uh the logan's run ending uh you know with that music the yeah window, that was amazing jesus yeah I'm, i I mean, you lived through it as well and i i feel like i got a little more of the tail end of it but like we we lived through a crazy like brutalist icon and music logo era where like every weird logo you would see at the beginning and end of shows or logos for businesses were, were such a weird, like the robots are rising, you know? <laughs> and you're just like sitting at home watching the sort of PBS logo go, <laughs> right. what the, it's very scary. I know it did. I, it was for me, I was scared of everything. So the seventies scared the hell out of me. And that's why yeah. I was so happy with the eighties and growing up basically in that era, because yeah. it is the most hilarious of decades. It's a, it's a great You're one. You're talking yeah. about movies, TV shows, clothing, music. It just doesn't stop. The hilarity never ends. I know. And as soon as the clock turned, right, well, I'd say about 1992, everything got more grungy and serious. Nirvana ruined everything of the comedy. I know. Well, that was a, definitely a, a shift. Uh, honestly, by, by the late 80s, the 80s themselves had kind of gone in a different direction yeah, then you were done with the 80s and then yeah it's like, just so funny i when you watch movies you don't even i play on the podcast all the time i'm like guess what 
decade this movie and i'll play a song from there guess what decade it's from and you instantly know just from oh, the yeah. music and totally like, like it's we a very distinct the sound so today i watched uh you know i said well let me watch i save up the family guy episodes sure uh, so when i'm in you know i want to be in a good mood so i haven't finished Great. the whole season because no they mean so much to me <laughs> and i always get at least three to four belly laughs belly laughs so i'm sitting by myself late at night you know watching that's all you can ask for, and that's all we could ever hope. So this one this, uh, this morning was the Terminator one. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I'm so glad that I saw it because, number one, you know, there was no opening credits, which is so rare. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah. and, and then what I noticed, and was, my question is, why did you choose this one to bring back all the classic references? Uh, the, the chicken, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the surfing bird. Oh uh, yeah, the cool whip. But he was saying Uber funny. Why Uber? What was he calling it? Yeah, Uber. Why Uber? Uber. <laughs> what was he calling it? Uber. Oh Uber. That's yeah, right. yeah, yeah. And why are you putting a why? Wait, are we doing this gag again? Why <laughs> that episode? Were all the gags back again? I th I think it was a lot because it when we do things like that where we're clearly parodying like one thing, it it you kind of need the help of your like go-to characters in, in those things, because it's, it's sort of hard to fill out with kind of wink, winky, fourth Wally jokes about like, Hey, we all know this movie so well. And some people honestly did that again, that movie now is so long ago. Right. Like a lot of people don't know that movie the way we do. Um, so it's nice to just throw in some of your greatest hits, you know, it's like yeah. at a concert all of a sudden, you know, and Paul McCartney's still playing, she loves you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, you know, yeah, that's the thing. I guess you're right. People don't like my nephew, probably, even though he's 19, probably doesn't know, probably never even seen Terminator one or two or another, three or whatever. Another good reaction video to watch on YouTube. Oh, Arthur, which one? The second one? Both. 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 And also, by the way, a great one, great reaction video is watching people watch Forrest Gump for the first time. Really? Why? Well, I don't know if we're going to get into an argument here, but I was a very pro Forrest Gump guy and I continue to be. No, me too. I love it. I can, okay, I've seen, great. I've seen it about a hundred times. Me too. It's a that masterpiece. Got, phew. Oh, thank yeah. you. Yeah, because of course you remember at the time there were a lot of like the stuffy kind of like um pulp fiction was art and forrest gump is like spoon feeding the masses by the way spoon feed me it's a movie like yeah. what more do i want from a movie than laughter tears great music and a great acting performance like what what do you what else do you want so yeah, you watch people watch forrest gump for the first time and that movie holds up so well and you watch it just work them like instantly you know like they're watching something they're like oh he's got braces on his legs and then you know like oh this teacher's creepy and then forrest gump makes fun of him by going e, e, e. Yeah, they're, right, in. Right. they're laughing you can see they're laughing then the, the braces you know every moment along the way is working to the point where they're weeping it, it's just great for me that movie i was really happy this is the kind of thing that makes me joyful that him and Sally Field are working together again because they were working punchline, you know? So I yeah. like when actors like that work together. It means they had a good time. Right. Let's do it again. You guys do that all the time, which makes sure. me thrilled with Mila Kunis and, uh, yeah. you know, and uh, who, who the guy that plays Chris? Uh, Seth Bobby. Green. Right. You. I mean, I've heard from, I've never met him and I've heard from multiple people, Jeff Ross's neighbors with him, that he is a great guy. Incredibly nice guy. Right, and it, obviously Mila Kunis must be terrific too because we're working with her. She's so sweet. Uh, wh why didn't? Why wasn't she in Ted Two? And if you don't want to tell me, you don't have to. Ooh, <laughs> it's depressing because um, I, you, you know, know, it's my it's favorite just, movie. I think it's just like sometimes there's a disconnect between what some what one person wants and what another person wants, and I feel, uh -huh. I feel like you know we were ho obviously hoping that she would be in it. Uh, and then when it came time for it, it just was something that they couldn't work out, you know, between her people and the, and the right, I guess that, but it was no ill will to do you still like working. No, with them? God, no, 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 no. Like if, if anything, like I, I, I'll bring it up jokingly sometimes and be like, well, you were smart enough not to be in Ted too. So you've got to know something, you know, like I'll, I'll just throw it to her as a compliment. So I disagree. I love Ted too. Obviously well, we, I like Ted one better, but Ted too. We, we've talked about this. Um, 
I think Ted two has a, the first half hour plus of Ted two, I think is fantastic. Like it's so funny. Uh, it sort of gets bogged down on the back half, like a lot of comedies do, but the, it just, it, it didn't maintain. I, I know what you're saying. It's like something like uh, trading places uh, with now. I like the train scene, but when I was first seeing it, I'm like, what happened to yeah. this movie? Yeah. It was so, uh, you know, and then, right. I say like even stripes, same thing with the, you know, the back half, but yeah. still the back half has scenes that it, you know when you compile them as a whole in my head like yeah. the, the courtroom scene uh which i was just talking about the, the yesterday where he starts playing angry birds on the phone <laughs> it's like uh, right. um let alone the opening scene which is actually i think the best one out of both movies where they're living in the apartment and yelling at each other oh, and right. throwing stuff and then he gets into the fight with the neighbor yeah uh, that's one of my favorite scenes in both movies. Yeah, so. well, obviously that's a that's a nod to Raging Bull. Um, oh, is that what that is? Oh, yeah. I just assume you know, and that's well, the, you know what? That's the thing, Alec. Is that what you're saying? It's a nod to Raging Bull, and I didn't even know it make now it makes sense when you're saying it, but it didn't even occur to me. Whereas where you're doing a Terminator gag uh, this you know this season, and my nephew's never seen it, but he's still gonna like it. So right. if Peter comes to Co co was it Quahog? Quahog. Quahog. If he comes uh, naked, he's my nephew's laughing at that for a completely different reason. Right, right. We know that's the way it works. Right, right. So I guess it always works on two different, clearly, because otherwise you wouldn't have a successful show. Yeah. Um, all I know is that one was very fun to write. I think it was written by Mark Hentiman. And I think if, you'll, if you're a, a fan of the show, when you see that it's an episode written by Mark Hentiman, it's always, like, very at the top. Like, he's he's such a funny writer. So that's my next question, then. Uh, I had Fred Stoller on the show last month. Ooh. <laughs> I'm getting the biggies. Only the biggies. Only the biggies. Um, R.I.P. Harris Whittles, humble Brad City. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he was talking about, you know, he wrote a, a year on Seinfeld yep. as a writer, you know, and he wrote a classic episode in The, uh, the Soup. Yep. And um, I was asked, and I said, and a matter of fact, I was just like, so when you write the episode, you know, and everybody's helping, where the editing goes, oh no, Seinfeld doesn't work like that. Seinfeld, you write the episode, and that's it. Wow. I am assuming Family Guy works like every other show, where yes, the writer gets the credit because he writes the the base and all the stuff, but it's punched up by everybody in the writing staff. A hundred percent, hundred percent, yeah. And it, it on our show, it's it's incredibly rare um that a script is like somehow untouched it's happened a couple it's happened a couple times you, the, the the day we first met or no we i actually i can remember this in my head you yeah. me said we're going we went to bubby's yeah i think for Bobby. dinner we met your friends uh yeah. who i later hung around with after and they, you know i think they got divorced uh remember this guy no we met some friends of yours they're very nice and we all ate dinner together and um, you told me that the episode coming up that week was an hour long. It was the bank vault one. And right. you told me that was one of the scripts that was pretty much untouched. Correct. Is, and is so correct? both of the untouched scripts are by the same writer, Gary Gennetti. And now he has been a writer on the show for a long time. He's hilarious. He created a show that aired for two seasons on the BBC called Vicious. Uh, with oh. Suri and McKellen and uh, Derek Jacoby, where they were like old gay couple living together. It, oh my it, God, that's and hilarious. he and Gary's gay, and that the show was hilarious. He just wrote a book last year that was like a New York Times bestseller, and it's so funny. Mm -hmm. So his scripts, when they come in, he, they're just ready to go. And especially, he basically, when Seth left the room, like this, Gary turned into Stewie. Like Gary is like the voice of Stewie. Um, and so when we get an episode of like Stewie and Brian in a, in the vault or, uh, Stewie in therapy, like remember right, no, with, with, with Ian McKellen, with that's, Ian McKellen. Why, that's clearly and, how you got him to do it then, I guess. Exactly. hundred percent. hundred percent. And it was a funny story about that. Cause I recorded him, Ian McKellen. And, uh, 
we while we had him, we had a, another bit in another show for "You Shall Not Pass" from Gandalf. Right, and we we ha- had that after he had done this whole episode. He looked at the, and I just hear on the other end like, "No, no, no! What is this? What is this Gandalf thing?" And and we said, "Oh well, this is you know we know you do the voice, so we thought maybe you could." He said, "Gandalf is not mine to give." <laughs> like, <you know? laughs> okay, so he didn't do it. Oh, that's too bad. Oh. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, I thought you were going to say like you had him there and the next week's episode was somebody playing Gandalf and you forgot to ask him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, we had him right here. We had him. What were we thinking? Oh, um, you were so kind. You let me come to the studio and watch you record. Uh, and I was lucky it was Patrick Warburton because we had met a couple of times before. Yes. And, um, boy, was that fun. I mean, yeah, there you are. You do You do it all, right? I mean, not only you are the... I mean, you were pretty much Seth MacFarlane because he is pulled from so many ways that you are in charge of everything. And there you are doing other stuff you probably don't need to do, but right. you want to make sure the product is, you know, well, you want to oversee. No, uh, hey, no, don't, never get it confused. I, I only do things that I am told I have to do. <laughs> so <laughs> it's not like I'm out there putting in that extra effort. Um, but uh, in, in fairness, I, I am the co-show runner with Rich Appel. And so we split all those duties and I've had a great time uh, working with him. There was something about... Uh, but it just seems oh, yeah. like somebody that... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, while we were talking about uh, voiceovers and, and nice voices that Ian McKellen has, we now, as you know, have um, uh, Sam Elliott on the show. He's the new uh, mayor. He's mayor... Oh, I didn't... Maybe oh, I guess I haven't gotten there yet. You haven't gotten to that one yet. Oh. So he plays Adam West's uh, cousin wild west oh that's and, and, brilliant right so he <laughs> he becomes mayor of the town and now cut to like a couple weeks ago we get word through uh clint eastwood's daughter allison eastwood that clint is a big fan of the show and would like to do a voice on the show. so today Whoa. literally we're going to be talking about putting together a story for wild west's father old west oh my god <laughs> be, uh, oh my god that's amazing i know i know and so the the funny part which is why i brought up voiceover sam elliott was recording for us yesterday and he just had a couple of lines to pick up and i told him the story i said you know and so it turns out clint eastwood is a, a fan and he's going to play your father old west there was a long pause and i just hear holy shit <laughs> like he was he was like speechless <laughs> i think he was sam elliot was uh he's been on your show before right because i could swear in, in yep. yeah. 16 or something he was doing a yeah he did like a car commercial right right so that's cool so you have a relationship with them yeah. so what you're saying to me right now is that clint eastwood's going to come into your studio and you're going to oh he's going to do it from home well, I mean, it would be much more likely that instead of taking the two and a half hour car drive down from Carmel, oh, I guess. that we would probably have some kind of studio there. Yeah, but, I guess. But, you know, who the <laughs> but you'll still see him on Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. OK, that's well, that's good enough, I guess. <laughs> it is funny. I've, I've always told people and I think we've talked about this before. You know, you're so, you know, you, it's great going to the family guy, you know, where you do all the stuff and you've shown me the writer's room and the board right. and all that kind of stuff. And it's cool, really cool. And then when you leave, there's a disappointment to it in the sense, because you didn't get to meet Stewie or Peter, not no. just, I'm not talking about Seth. I'm talking about you just, you can never meet. Right. right. It's, it's weird. And then you go like, but that was such a good time. What's the matter with me? And then I realize I'm like. Oh, I didn't really get to shake Stewie's hand. Right. <laughs> like I, you were thinking going in that that might be possible. There's such a part of your life. It's uh, they. It seems right. like they really exist. It's amazing. Uh, yeah. It's it's well. It's a mostly a disappointment now for people when they come because I'm like, come to a table read. Uh, Seth's not here anymore. Come on in. You know. And so, it doesn't bother me. You were. It was great. You, well, he did it on the phone. So it was. Uh, oh, well, that's where we're, we're I, past that now. Oh, well, I got lucky and he was on the phone and you, I was in an actual table read and you were so kind to invite me in. It was so fun. Oh, no. It was so good. exciting for me. Yeah. It's and good. Um, it was just great to watch the process and uh, very exciting to, you know, see an episode that I'm not going to see for a year or, right. or, or more. Right, and right, that right. kind of stuff really makes me happy. I remember being at Gary Shandling's house 
uh, the basketball court once and he gave me a, a Larry Sanders script and he asked me my opinion and I read it right there on the basketball court and he's like, wait, you, you think it's good? You know, I mean, I, I mean, what are you uh, kidding? I mean, this is the greatest day of my life. It's unbelievable. Was it, was it one of the episodes or was it just, it didn't air. It, oh. They didn't do, it was weird. It was, I, I think it was one with Woody Harrelson and hemp. Like maybe they used parts of it, but yeah, as a whole, it was weird because I thought it was great. And he just had such a ridiculous high standard that even the, the best ones for other shows. Well, I mean, that show is absolutely in my top five all time uh, sitcoms. And, and I've been lost in a wormhole of it lately on HBO Max. And I've just been I mean, I think I've been talking about this with, with a friend of mine. We watched it with like Hank Kingsley might be one of the best drawn out characters in television history. Like he's he his you understand him so well and it's heartbreaking, but it's hilarious. It's he's one of the greatest characters in television history. Forget, forget comedies to all. I agree. And uh, let alone uh, Artie, of course, is oh. unbelievable. Okay. So first drink of all, it, I... drink it, you pussy. <laughs> That's excellent. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. um, first of all, I'm planning on doing Larry Sanders podcast. Oh, Going well, now see, you're you're killing me because you do a Billy Joel podcast. I know I on that. You do a Larry Sanders podcast. Get me on that. And now I'm just here talking to plain old you. <laughs> Share that with me because I'm very passionate about that show. I love it from start. Me to too. Time. So, um, do you remember seeing the Gary Shandling 25th anniversary special on Showtime? No. Okay, so that was my comedy bible. It came out around '82 or '3. Okay, you know, just when I was starting you know, to understand sure. greatness of other comedy that wasn't SCTV, which was my complete comedy Bible. Yeah. Uh, so he did this thing called the Gary Johnny 25th anniversary, like a fake Johnny Carson 25th anniversary. Oh, I can't believe you've never seen it. It was on Showtime. And it was like a half hour and it was just, the, or maybe an hour. And it was the greatest thing I've ever seen. I knew ever, I've watched it and watched it and watched it over and over again. And I'm, when he started doing Larry Sanders, I'm like, well, this, comes from the 25th anniversary special clearly he's always wanted to do this type of show yes. uh, that's how he got the it's the gary shandling show after that but then you know then finally that one but it's all from that and this is what i would talk about in the pockets it stems from that so the his co-host was the guy he ended up using um a couple times as his accountant i know who you're talking about paul paul he, he ended up on cheers yeah yeah the little with, little short with glasses yes. yeah and he was supposed to be Hank. Hank. Yeah. That was the plan. Yep. And Sarah told me that because I asked what happened and he goes, well, we got a call from uh, what's, what's Hank's uh, real Tambor. name? Yeah. Jeffrey, yeah, Tambor. Jeffrey Tambor. And he goes, uh, and I guess, I don't know whether he's in Hank's character or he's actually like this. And he gets a call on the machine. He goes, uh, look, uh, I need this. <laughs> My career needs this, and he was just like, you know, "We got to use this guy. He's exactly what we're." It's doing. exactly <laughs> what Hank is. So well, I got way, that was. I mean, no offense to to Paul, uh, but but there's no way he could have been better than Tambor in that part. No, it would have been different. It would have been different, and it, would it wouldn't have been the same. And the funny, I, it just makes me happy that he continued to use him, the guy Paul, anyway. Yes. And I was glad that he got on Cheers, because I, yeah. you, you can picture the guy blowing his brains out. You know, like, cause, uh, well, it's, like, it's like Stephen Merchant. You know, Stephen Merchant, I think, was supposed to be Gareth on the British office. Oh, is that right? I think. And then they ended up using him in like a smaller part later. And then, of course, Stephen Merchant went on to. Yes, thank God. Like kind of like Larry David in a way, yeah. uh, you know, we're, we know his genius. But um, yeah. yeah, so uh, with Hank. Uh, oh, yeah. By the way, with this with this podcast idea now, I'm, I'm, I'm talking myself into a corner. But like you you need me on that because the the uh, comparisons when I watch Larry Sanders to things that I've seen in Kilbourne when I was working for Craig Kilborn, like to, the, the, the talk, sh the way Larry Sanders plays the talk show host is so real and hilarious. Like the, it, it's awesome. And, it, but one of the great things, and I don't know when they decided to do this because the show is just straight funny. It's comedy of all, all every, all the best kinds of comedy, great jokes, amazing character, you know, comedy. But then usually towards the end of each episode, Larry has like a human moment where he, you know, states clearly and humbly and like with difficulty, 
he's like, you know, when he says to Roseanne, like, I, you know, wanted to bump you because you hurt me. And I guess I was trying to hurt you. Like, it's, it's great. They put those things in there just enough to, to make you love the whole thing. You, you said exactly what I was hoping you were going to say, because oh, some of the serious that. moments in shows like that are my favorite moments. Oh, yeah. And you can just add it. You guys do it in Family Guy a lot, too. And that is so important. It doesn't always have to be. I mean, we love joke, joke, joke. Yeah, sure. But you got to have the human moments. You're so right. And yeah. that was my favorite. And that's what who would have thought Gary Shannon was a good actor? He was so good. He was amazing. To be able to, and, and of course he's playing a, a version of himself, which right. helps, but it's really it's hard. hard to yeah. Yeah, it's really hard <laughs> to, to do that well. You know, it's you can do it like, you know, capably, but to really nail it and to nail the insecurities in yourself that are hilarious, like it, you really well, have to be able to see yourself. I will tell you the prime example of that is that when I was on Sarah's uh, show, the Sarah Silverman Project, you know, they... You know, they wrote this one episode for me, right? Where I played the most obnoxious person in the history of obnoxious yeah. people. Oh, and when on. she was like, just, you know, it's one of those things where they're like, you know, just be, you know, the way you are. <laughs> if I didn't have a self awareness of the way people think I'm a genuine idiot, right. it would have been problematic. Right, right. <laughs> but I was, and she goes, you know, just be, I'm like, nah, I, I got I, it. I, I, I know got what you're it. saying. Because you're right. I've worked with so many people. I'm like, no, do that thing, you know, right. the way you're always like, pissing people off or, or talking garbage and they they're like what are you saying i'm i'm like that and yeah. they don't get it i so know i know exactly what you're saying and it is hard to play what people's perception is yes. of you and to and to bring it out like that and it was amazing on that show and some you know i think about seinfeld they had one tender moment in the series and it's one of my favorites and it's in the early years where i don't really mm -hmm. care i like watching after the third season let me think let me think if I can think of when it is. Tender moment, early seasons. I can't. What? It's when Elaine and Jerry break up. And oh. it is one tender moment. They're sitting on that bench that Kramer got for her. Right. And she's like, he's like, so what? We can't be friends anymore? And she's like, no. And, th and it's a serious moment. And they never right. did it again. Right. There's only two seconds, but it does set the entire tone for the series for their relationship. Yes. So it is the most important of all things. Right, right, right. Oh, that's great. So I love it. I love that's great. I love moments. Every script I've ever written, which of course goes nowhere, just always has a moment like that. Yeah. And um, what's another good example? I mean, there's so many, you know, your our oh. favorite movies have that moment, you of know. Of course. And I mean, and then and then shows kind of went to overdo that where you felt like you were looking at like five of those a year on friends, and it's like, okay. Uh, you right. know, you're, no, you're, not, they... you're not doing this the right way. But there are, yes. Oh, prime example for me is uh, the British office, the ending of the British oh office. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it, it, it like, the, a couple, there's that moment where the, uh, the two guys are giving Ricky Gervais shit about the woman that he brought to the His thing. And, is, he, yeah. and, he, and he tells him to fuck off. And, and like, it was so serious. And you felt chills okay. for him. Well, yeah. I've, that, when I saw that, that's why I never watched the American office. Yeah. I, I was like, no, no, they've, it's done for me. So people are office. like, you've yeah. got to see it. And, but I, that last Christmas episode was one of the great, I compare that to goddamn crimes and misdemeanors. Totally. Because you are laughing with your crying laughing at one part when he's making those videos. Yes. And yeah. then you're emotionally involved at that last scene where he, where his character just comes to yeah. this. What oh. I had to take a walk around the block. Oh. I've never seen anything like it in my life. And they, they play Only You by Yaz when Don Tinsley comes back and, and like I plants about him on him. It was so great. And, but that's, also you know, and I always think about that excellent example that you brought up, Friends, because that same year, Friends ended their 10-year run with the worst last episode I've ever seen. I didn't care about any of those characters. And I love the show, yeah. but it didn't work for me the way two, 12 episodes of the office and i'm like i am i think i'm done with american television quite right now. goddamn brilliant 12 uh, episodes and i felt for that character like i would never have felt for monica or, or ross or anybody unbelievable and and that just to speak of hilarious moments in that christmas episode when he's doing like the the online dating and he's waiting for the girl and he catches her and he goes oh for fuck's sake <laughs> like she, <laughs> she's like a little heavier than he thought <laughs> right, right. 
And then, then when he's waiting at the party for his real date and that heavy woman comes in and he was yeah. like, so he was like, oh, not again. He was an awful character. Yes. And then in that last bit, met a woman that turned him around and that is good movie making. Yes. Script writing. And, and while at the same time, completely nailing and redefining the mockumentary form. Like, right. you know, it's it's the thing we all see now. It's, you know, the American office and Parks and Rec and, and, and a million shows, uh, you know, are, are like this, where it's like they're aware they're being kind of filmed. But the British office did it in a way that totally made sense and was organic. And, and the way he was using it for comedy was uh, still, I don't know that it'll ever be surpassed. I mean, no, it was I don't like, think so. The final tap was to I that. You know, I was going to say, Spinal Tap is the yeah. one, the first one we saw like that, or at least that yeah. I know about it. And um, it's so, there you go again. There's there's a movie. It's a perfect example. That tender moment where, where they're telling him that Sex Farm just made it in Japan and they want to get the band back together. Yes. And they're telling Nigel, so you just come in with the wave of your wand or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And then, then when they're going out to play, he says, David, have a good show. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, and yeah. it's like moving. Yeah, and you're yeah. like, I can't believe this comedy that just made me laugh for 90 minutes just also moved me inside. And God I, damn it! I know it was so well done. And, and I'm then, of sure course, I... when he brings him back on stage, yeah, get out here. It's hard to make shows like that, movies and totally. shows like that. It's really you have to be someone very special. I'm sure I've. And talked... you know, you guys did it in TED, quite frankly, too. I mean, it's a uh, you know, yeah, there's well... great. I mean, that is a laugh out loud comedy. There's so many jokes. I mean let alone the uh <laughs> when, when ted comes out of the thing and that uh giovanni uh, is waiting for him and he goes well are you alone he goes uh yeah but you're never alone with christ uh you know <laughs> something like i mean and you know every line is 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 great but then of course there are those couple of scenes that you need yeah. for well, it to seth not is, seth is a big proponent of that like i mean he he agrees with that a hundred percent like he he knows that you can make something that's hilarious, but doesn't really stick or resonate on a higher level. And I think he knows that adding those moments of emotion, uh, you know, real emotion, help send it to another stratosphere, which frankly is something that I struggle with in my writing because I just want to do joke, 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 joke. Oh, but, you do? But I never I, have a problem with the... Uh... No, no, I, I, I see its value. Um, and I, I just sometimes forget to do it. So it's a nice reminder. Yeah, no, I'm glad we feel similar. Uh, while you mentioned Craig Kilborn, I actually had a Patreon um, a subscriber that wanted to ask you this question about mm -hmm. the Craig Kilborn show. His name is awesome. Gabriel. Gabriel is a great guy. He's, uh, uh, you know, he's watches every loves Family Guy, loves everything. Right. Uh, he says uh, a regular gag on that show was a member of the crew who used to spontaneously sing Looking Glass Brandy for no reason. And he was curious who it was and how that came about. That was me. Shut up. Yeah. <laughs> well, this this is the goddamn ice yeah. thing all over again. Where, yeah. the, the, if you folks, <laughs> if you don't know, I mean, the, 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 Alec wrote the you know he wrote the Star Wars thing. You didn't write the Empire Strikes Back one, but I mean you were involved, right? But the, in the Family Guy, and I and I see yeah. you one day. We're already friends, and I'm like, oh my god, I just watched the Empire Strikes Back one, and my favorite is with the guy on the ice planet. Just go, hey, you want some ice? He goes, that was me. Yeah, that was just my... saying that every time I ask you stuff. Maybe, maybe <laughs> that's right. That was my voice so with the yeah. ice guy. Um, How did that come yes, about with the brandy thing? Why? The brandy thing. So I used to play this character on that show named Mike Grayson. I don't know what that has to do with anything, but I would come out and my whole shtick was, and it was Craig's idea and people seem to like it, um, where I would just, he would ask me about stuff and I would say, everything sucks. Like, so he'd say, what do you think about this? I think it sucks. And then, you know, it was back when saying sucks on TV was a little edgier, I guess. And so uh, everything would suck. It was back when I smoked, I was like chain smoking the whole time. And then he was like, well, is there anything that you do like? And I'm like, well, you know, I like uh, the song, uh, you know, Brandy by Looking Glass. And then it would just kick in and I'd start to sing it. But it was actually, cause I did the Brandy one a couple of times, but it was m mostly um, uh, Little River Band's Reminiscent. Oh. <laughs> so I would, I would actually I sing that, that one. That one and, goes up with my head a lot for some reason. <laughs> right. And also he liked, if you're going to San Francisco, we did that a couple of times. 
Oh, that's so funny. Isn't that funny that there's, he said there's nothing on the internet about and he couldn't find out? He goes, Oh, yeah, you can't find it. If, if he looks up, I believe if you look up Mike Grayson Kilborn, then you might be able to get some some version of it. Do you know anything that's happening with Craig Kilborn these days? I do. Well, first of all, Craig is, I, I talk to him often and he oh. is hilarious on Instagram. Like he's found his his medium it, it, it he's still pl- playing the character of like the holier than thou pretty boy who's like life was, is perfect it was a brilliant character i loved yeah. that he used to announce himself uh, by the way i love that too yeah i love that just the balls to do that is the so goal, funny. Right? <laughs> um but he, he on on instagram he's so hilariously craig and it, he's just kind of nailing it so yeah i, t- I talked to him a lot he uh, on the podcast that I'm going to do with Goldie, he did our intro. Like, so he, he you know, like he introed himself, he introed us, which was nice. Uh, what well, is your podcast going to be about? Well, it's, uh, it's called a typical disgusting display. Um, and it's a podcast uh, for writers by writers who hate writing. So that's oh, kind of like our little hook, but uh, the, the, the term, a typical disgusting display this will test your sports knowledge. I don't know if, uh, if you remember legendary Boston Celtics radio announcer Johnny Most. Uh, no. He he he, I, he had a voice like this, like and Bird steals it, Bird stole it. <laughs> he, he was just very old and crotchety, but he used to hate the Detroit Pistons as we all did in, right. in Boston. And there was a game in Detroit where the Pistons were particularly hard fouling us or whatever. And Johnny went off on a rant in the middle of a thing, and he just said, "And this is a." a Typical, a typical disgusting display. <laughs> like we just thought that was a very funny title, so we we have that little sound bite in our in our intro. But oh, then we, just, cool. we loosely talk about writing and like kind of our journeys, and then we have a theme each week of like spec scripts or. And, and who is this guy, Mayor Goldie Wilson? You said Mayor Goldie Wilson, <laughs> Mayor. Um, but. Uh, no, it's uh, John Goldblatt, uh, otherwise known as Julius Sharp. He's very... Uh, Why do I know that name? Because he's hilarious on Twitter. He's um, And he's written for Family Guy. So you've seen his name oh. on Family Guys and, and all that stuff. But uh, I, I did stand up with him when I first started in, in 96. And, and I always and forget. Been, been friends ever since. And uh, so... And I always wrote- forget. I don't know how we didn't meet back then. I... Well, because I was, because you were at a different level than I was. I was at the absolute bottom rung and never got any higher. I just I'm luckily, still at that level. I, but no, no, no. <laughs> but there's a difference. Like you can go to certain clubs and you'll get put up. Like whereas I was only at open mics and Gladys's. Right, you know, right, like, right. That's it. <laughs> um, or Gotham Bringer shows. So like I never. I was so lucky to get a job in writing, so I didn't have to keep being terrible at stand up. And I, I obviously I don't want to. We I mean I've been having a really good time. I could talk another hour, but I do not want to keep you. And you're a very busy man. But I will ask you, how did you get that writing job or a writing job on Kilborn? I mean, you just submitted hey, or? Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, well, it's it's um, so it just to go back. I was an intern and a writer's assistant at Saturday Night Live. We've talked about that before. And uh, there was a writer there for Weekend Update. His name is Ross. Abrash. He, uh, you know, very funny joke writer for Norm. And he was hired uh, to the Late Late Show with Craig Kilborn. Now, he was friendly, not so much with me, but with my friend Wellesley Wild, whose name you recognize from Ted and, and yes. Family Guy. And we, and well, you guys are like almost writing partners, right? We were for a while. So we, Wellesley and I went to college together. We were both became interns at SNL and, and, and he went on to work there like in the research department or something. So when Ross got that job in LA, Ross said to Craig, hey, I know this guy Wellesley Wild, who's a funny joke writer, you should check him out. So Wellesley sends in his packet, gets hired. And, and I'm like, oh my God, this is the best thing ever. So then within the first week, Wellesley in turn says to Craig, I have a friend who I think you'd think is funny. Like I sent in my pack got hired like a week later. So it was like a great wow daisy chain of, you know, getting yanked out there. Thank God. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Because yeah, you don't want to be, you know, hanging out with Pachetti at the New York Comedy Club. Oh. <laughs> the 
Thank you very much. You know, you're the only person that still like that. Actually, Bichetti actually knows, you know, like, um, uh, you know how he would have that back in the 90s, a call chain of people that he would just call and tell you what's going on. Be like, Alec, you and I need to work together. You know, it'd be great. You, me and Kilborn on the show and we'll do stuff together. And he would always call people. And he had, I didn't realize he had a chain. I thought I was the only one. We're like, Dave, we got to hang. We got to do the odd couple together. It'd be great if I played, you know, Jack Clark, where you play Felix. And um, then I found out he was calling everybody that way. <laughs> but well, it's, a, it's a numbers game for Mike. And yeah, it, it was a good way of. Uh, but he is like, he is like the sweetest guy. And I think that if he, if he could, and I always used to say, say this to Brody, and we saw how that worked out. Yes. But if he can find, <laughs> uh, if Machete can find a way to effectively market like what he is, because he yeah. is something, he's yeah. for sure something. Like if he could find the right vehicle for himself, it would be huge for him. I always said that for Brody too, but, and I, uh, I use him all the time and stuff, uh, you know, as that guy or whatever, I always have something for him to do. Yeah. And uh, he's, he's a nice guy, but it's funny. You're the only one, like where all the names he mentions when he calls you, you know, like, you know, I, I was talking, you know, Adam Sandler said he loved me, you know, like, you know, 20 years ago or something. And, and he says that with him and uh, Barry Katz or whatever, but yeah. you're the only actual one that says, no, I actually really do like Mike. <laughs> <laughs> and I acknowledge his presence. You're like the only yeah. one. Oh, uh, well, I, I will continue to acknowledge this. Shows you what a kind person you are. <laughs> to some people. <laughs> well, to me, for sure. Absolutely. I really appreciate you uh, coming on the show today. I have so oh. much more to ask you, but I will not. Let's save it time. for uh, either the Sanders one or the Joel one. Yeah. Well, no, you have to come on the Billy Joel one. There's just, you yeah. You must come on that one. But we do, do every letter, so there's plenty yeah. of time for that. I told you we're having Sarah on uh, next week or whenever be after the seas because we sang Code of Silence together at the Triple Inn. <laughs> in the 90s so we have to that's awesome have well this on. is where a, a more of a, a sort of a flaky la type person would say like oh you know what have me out for zanzibar and just hope that <laughs> on by then. i love zanzibar i've heard that from i think you actually said that when i said that like, i'd like to talk about zanzibar i'm like no that no it, no you know what my favorite uh i mean i we could talk about this forever well, tell me but, what is your favorite? But a, a specific song that i don't feel like i mean i'm sure you really like it but is um now I'm gonna now I'm gonna forget the name of the goddamn song. Uh oh, uh Street Life Serenader. Oh, you that's your one of your favorites. I love or, that song. We Rob, we haven't gotten into that yet. And yeah. you know what the thing is? Obviously, I've heard the song before, but I don't remember how it goes. And I don't remember how a lot of the songs go, but I've been having such a good time. I'm waiting. I can't yeah. listen to Billy Joel anymore because I've been having a good time, like Today we're recording, I think, close to the borderline. Oh, yeah. I haven't heard that song in many years. Yeah. And obviously, I listen to Glass House 100, but I can't think of how it goes. Yeah. And so I played it today, and I'm like, oh, right. You know, and yeah. I'm having a good time kind of doing it that Re way. Reacquainting yourself. Yeah, it's kind of fun. So well, I'm I, can do the outro, I can do the outro music for today. Street Life Serenader. <laughs> Well, that's perfect. <laughs> well, thank you. Also, um, so obviously Alex Sulkin uh, has Family Guy, which you can watch, uh, I guess, next season. But yeah. it's always in reruns, and it's on TBS every Monday because that's when I watch it. Right. And um, you also have a Cameo account. Oh, yeah, la-di-da. Oh, they fucking begged me. <laughs> it was like It was literally like one person reached out and asked a question, hey, would you like to do this? I'm like, yep. <laughs> well, I was just trying to promote it so people... Thank you. It's very nice of you. On. I have to make fun of myself for it, though. That's part. I understand that, too. Is there anything else you would uh, like to tell us that we should look out for or watch? I know you have a lot of secret aside, stuff. But... Aside from watching this podcast, which everyone should be doing Thank at you. all times, um, yes, I'm going to be doing one with uh, John Goldblatt, a typical disgusting display. It's not out yet, but it will be soon. Excellent. Alex Sulkin, thank you so much for taking the time out and doing this. I really appreciate it. Welcome. Please hang on to your wigs and keys. The Night Fly with Dave Juskow. Well, tell me he isn't one of the greats, one of the great guests, because, you know, he knows all the reference. I mean, obviously, it's from Family Guy. That's all they do. I, I've told you before, they, I think they only do bits to please me. That's the way it certainly seems. I don't know. That's what I get out of it. But, you know, he knows all the references and all the good stuff. And look, I mean, you know, he's excited that they're thinking about doing a Larry Sanders podcast. He's like, you got to have me on that podcast. Let alone he wants to be on the Billy Joel podcast. He was disappointed that this wasn't the Billy Joel podcast. I mean, how much do I love this guy? 
And like I said, we just hit it off day one. It's very rare to meet another dude that way. Well, it was good that we met him with girlfriends because it's hard to meet another guy because guys are to meet another guy that you like, it's difficult because there's, you know, a lot of gay stuff involved that you have to get over first because it's, you know, <laughs> I know it sounds horrible, but it's a thing. And any, every guy knows what I'm talking about. And the girl's like, oh, that's horrible. But the guys know what exactly what I'm talking about. And the girls know too. It's very difficult to meet another guy friend because you, you get, sometimes you meet a guy and you're just like, I love that guy. And, like, and then the girls get jealous. They're like, oh God, he loves him so much. They love each other, but it's hilarious. And uh, how do you not like that guy? He's great and he's up for doing the podcast and he's up for doing the Billy Joel podcast. He's obviously busy as shit since I'm pretty sure he wrote Ted during the weekends while he was working on Family Guy. So that's unbelievable. Anyway, next, well, all right, let me show you what I wanted to show you. I'm going to share my screen if you're watching the video portion of the podcast um and if you're listening to the audio portion which most people do i would just describe it to you this is the photo when i was opening for a tell last week i wanted to show you that where my sister was supposed to sit and you can see why she left because you would have had to look through the taps the beer taps to actually see me and you can see i'm performing through the beer taps it's a hilarious picture I guess I should put it on Instagram. So in case, you know, if you're not watching the, the YouTube one, it's, it's pretty funny. Um, and then here's just me uh, performing at the crossroads in Garwood, making some nonsense uh, faces. Uh, Ryan Reese was kind enough to take them. There's me yelling at the audience and here's me doing something stupid. And, uh, that, you know, it's not, it, 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 you know, you don't have to see it. I just thought I'd share it with you if you are watching the thing. But it, this one, hilarious, of course, yelling at the audience, screaming at the audience. I'm very angry at the audience. That's, I'm the, I'm the Larry David of our generation. But uh, as you can see, live on stage with people's heads. It's actually a thing nowadays. Here is me at Rachel's kid. Remember I said I went to the one-year birthday. This is Rachel's mother-in-law. And here's Carmen Lynch in the back and I just popped in all the pictures, you know, I totally photobombed everything. So I didn't, I don't think they wanted me there. Here's the other one with Rachel and little Frankie and Rachel's mom. And again, Carmen Lynch in the background, cause she's so tall. She can't not be in a photo, but uh, that's a really good one. And oh, uh, here's me performing at, uh, the Sheba's new room, you can see I'm having a good, the audience, look, you can see people actually laughing. This is a phenomenon. That's, this picture was taken by Elon Altman. There's, you can actually see people laughing in the audience. I'm telling you, I was having a really good time that day. I was very happy. And when I'm in a good mood, I do well, but you can see it's a tent. So it's a loophole because it's in a bar, but it's a tent uh you know with it outside it's outside you can see the trees and everything so she was able to perform there all during covid and now it's the place to be for some god knows reason but you see it's a little tiny place but it was a fun time and here's me completely drunk at the shore uh last week drinking a martini <laughs> on the beach but you can see the this is the boardwalk right here the cabanas and uh that was a lovely restaurant i'm just blowing through them because they're not great but this is what i wanted to show you this is a picture of the mall where they want to do the show, which right now I am like, I don't want to do this. I mean, I know I've been wanting to do the mall, but if I got to get the lights and the security and put up the tickets, this is just more than I bargained for. I'm good at booking the room. I'm not good at getting people in. I'm not good at doing any of the other stuff you have to do. I'm just good at putting together a show. The other stuff is not for me. I mean, maybe I could be that guy, but I don't know if I want to be that guy. But you can look at this. I mean, this is the this is the mall, right? Look, it's just in this grassed area that's fenced in. People have to bring their own chairs. And there's a shed there. What is that shed? I don't know. I guess it's the green room. But I'm like, is this worth it? I took the picture from my car. Here's you can see here's the here's the the, the bar that's next door and the, the Macy's to the right of it. And that's that's what it looks like. And you know, you must be saying if you're watching this on YouTube right now, saying yeah, why does he want to waste his time with this? I, I'm assuming. I don't know. Tell me what you think if I should actually do a show in this space. I, I, I took a wider shot of Macy's right next door. Should I do this show? I'm really on the fence. And when I say on the fence, I just want to cancel. I really don't want to put time and effort into it. It just seems ridiculous. It's so stupid. And, oh, here's a picture of the giant shrimp I was talking about that they had at that place. 
Look at that. That's giant shrimp. And it was delicious. Look how delicious this plate of oysters and giant shrimp looks. If this isn't Dave Juskow's favorite meal and day ever, you know what I'm talking about. That shrimp is bigger. It can't even, it's so big, it can't curve to put on a glass. They have to lay it flat because it's so huge. It's fantastic. And this is the picture Memo took while he was charging his car because where we would think about doing the show uh, has uh, carports, uh, uh, you know, charging, Tesla charging places. So <laughs> it's also Memo was there uh, the other day. So they're not classic photos. Are there any reason why you would uh, sign up on Patreon to, oh, I got to see the video portion of the podcast? No. But it's something else. Oh, and let me also uh, share this with you. This is the, uh, I, I remember I was going to tell you about this. This is the promo. Remember, we're talking about the guy from ABC who does at Vegas coming up on an all new too close for comfort. And Ted t- kicks his daughters out of the apartment and doesn't bargain for what he's bargaining for. I, obviously, I'm uh, it's not my head. And then Jack, Janet, and Chrissy throw a reunion party for the Ropers, but someone wants them dead. Well, that's uh, what we did when we were in school. So if you are watching the video portion, I've already played the audio portion for you. Uh, on the podcast but this is the video portion so i'm not doing the voice and this is from 1984 but i'm the killer in all the uh videos so i thought i'd show it to you we did it in college and uh i thought i would share it with you right now denied on abc is another great lineup of danger and comedy first jonathan and jennifer travel to switzerland to protect an ambassador and his sexy wife but it could be their last trip because someone wants them dead on heart to heart then matt houston teams up with two beautiful cheerleaders but it could be his last hurrah because someone wants him dead on matt houston and then jack janet and cindy throw a reunion party for the ropers but this party may be their last, because Mr. Furley wants them dead on Three's Company. All tonight on ABC. Well, you know, um, it is what it is. and uh, <laughs> But uh, we were doing that guy's voice since the 80s. You can see my old nose, uh, which is exciting. My friend John Vitti plays... Uh, who Robert Wagner, we've had him on the show before, works for the Boston Globe. And then, of course, I uh, fooled around with one of the cheerleaders in the uh, thing, the one on the right-hand side. <laughs> she was hot. You know. And um, and Danny Vermont, who is on our uh, Billy Joel podcast this week, is the one playing uh, Jack Tripper in the uh, Roper's parody. And then I'm on top, and I'm wearing my Warner's hat, which is the company my dad used to work for. It's a bra and girdle company. I, I don't know what I was doing. Thinking that I well listen, I didn't know what I was doing. I don't think I had any sports hats. I think when I was twelve, I had a Budweiser hat and then that Warner's hat, and I used to wear that like that was a smart thing to do for some reason. But I suppose good in these days because uh, you know you couldn't have that sports product placement. So how could they show that on YouTube? Does anyone really care? I don't think so. Anyway, that is pretty much the show for today. So uh, not you know it's not a, a long show. Maybe it is. I don't know all combined together but uh basically thank you for indulging me and we didn't have this on last week but we had it on uh, the week after because you know i'm in boston and uh doing my thing so next week next week i assure you the whatever the, the 15th i got a story for you that's uh it'll be the best episode ever wait do you wait do you hear what i'm about to tell you i, I I'm, I'm keeping it a secret but I'm, I'm doing something i'm filming something next week that you will be able to see on television in September during Sweeps Week. And I haven't shared it yet with you because I wasn't sure if it's happening. So next week, I will be sharing this unbelievable, maybe the funniest thing you've ever seen on television. I promise. On paper, again, it, it, it should be brilliant, and hopefully it'll come off that way on television. But I, I promise it'll be worth the price of admission for this show, which is free. Well, actually, if you're on Patreon, uh, it'll be worth whatever you're paying monthly on Patreon. I promise you. I promise you. And I'll try and get some bonus stuff, too. So anyway, all next week, trust me. Trust me. (laughs) It's it's gonna blow your mind. (laughs) It's really good. Uh, Anyway, that's our show for today. 
I hope that everybody had a great time. Alec, thank you so much, Alex Holkin, for being on the show. And thank you for being a very loyal Nightfly listener and watcher and viewer, whatever it is called, on our monthly oil video. I can't say it any other way. And we will see you next week on the Nightfly Podcast. Good night, everybody. Good night.